Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Class of Two Zero Live today. It's Saturday, uh, February the 9th. And uh, for anyone listening to the recording for the first time, we'll just give you some uh, background on how you can access resources and information during the session uh, or afterwards in that we have a live binder. And I think uh, Peggy or Kim is going to drop the link in for the live binder. It's shown on the slides. That link on the slides is not active, but you will find uh, a, tr all the collection, a collection of all the links and resources shared today. And if you find someone has, or you have something to share in the chat and it's uh, presentation appropriate, we gather those as well and add that to the live binder. And just take a notice that uh, we do have a new um, display with the uh, live binder and that you're using the sidebar and all the links are um, represented in that fashion instead of across the top of the screen. So. If you missed the live binder or you're looking for the live binder and don't want to watch the recording, you can go to our resources and archives page at our website at live.class20.com and you're going to find a link to the live binder. You're going to find all the links in the live binder in our in the live binder of the session in our blog post. You'll get an MP3 recording, uh, embedded video file, as well as the full Blackboard Collaborate recording. And then on top of that, a uh, collection of the chat log posted there as well. So we've got it covered for all the different areas that you might need to um, access after or during the show. So here's why I said you have to get working on yourself. I'm going to ask you to uh, select the laser pointer, which is the second icon down on the left hand side of your whiteboard. Hold on to the mouse and tell us where you are located in the world. I see Thailand is represented by Shambles. He hasn't put up his little star yet. Um, people across the United States, Canada. I know where I am, it's snowing. It has snowed. We had a lot of cold weather here today. Others that may have been enjoying nice, sunny, warm weather. But it is great to see where we are located across the world. So thank you very much, everyone. Now we're going to ask you to do some uh, voting, answering our poll questions. And our first question is today, do you have a personal or professional blog? Obviously a green check if it's a yes and a red X if it's a no. And I'll wait for a minute till people have voted. And I'm going to let everybody know how that voting went to see how Many people are actually um, blogging, and a great deal, Matt, are doing that. So I think whatever we're going to see today is just going to enhance and augment what they're already doing. So thank you. Let's move to the next poll question. It's going to thank you, Kim, for clearing the votes. Do you have? Do your students have individual blogs in school? So yes, if they do. No, if they don't. Green check. Yes. Red X. No. Do your students have individual blogs in school? OK, I'm just going to publish the results. And we're split there. About a third haven't been able to answer in, in the poll. Been chatting there, indicating their votes in the chat. I saw some of them. And another third are, and another third aren't. So let's clear the votes and go to the next poll question. Do your students build digital portfolios throughout the year? So just waiting for that answer. I think most people have voted. Let's take a look at uh, the results. And again, we're about to 30, 30, 30. So it's good. very interesting statistics for Matt to consider during his presentation. So thank you, everyone. We uh, appreciate um, your participation during the poll sections and the world next. So I'd like to move on now and officially welcome Matt to the session. Uh, I know that Matt's going to add some more uh, information 
about his background, but I want you to know he has a former classroom teacher and he's co-founder of KidBlog, the world's largest education blogging platform. Matt created uh, EdBlogs out of his own need to have a safe uh, blogging platform for his elementary students. And he's so happy that it provides essential user management and content moderation features for teachers. And Matt has a passion for creating rich learning experiences for students through the transformative use of technology in the classroom. Matt, I know that KidBlogs is uh, a very well used uh, platform here in Canada. And so I'm very excited to see that um, you're here today, and I know everyone else is going to benefit from your uh, presentation about Kid Blogs. And so now it's my opportunity to again thank you very much uh, for being with us. And I know that we have a newbie question for you, so you can uh, take the mic and uh, take a shot at the question. What is Kid Blog? Which I think you're going to have a very easy answer. Thanks very much, Matt, for being with us today. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, good morning or afternoon, wherever you may be, um, and happy snow day to some of you on the East Coast. It looked like there were a lot of uh, laser pointers pointing to New England there, so we're glad you're hunkered down and, and made it in. So it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, the newbie question, I guess, is a good one before we get started on this path for the next uh, 30, 40 minutes or so. Uh, what is KidBlog? Uh, KidBlog is a platform for teachers to create safe individual blogging spaces for their students. So um, the key there is that we really are focused on teachers, but we empower students to create these really rich uh, individual blogging spaces all underneath kind of the, the moderating influence of a teacher who can choose to make um, those student blogging spaces as public or private as, as they want. So, um, so for all the teachers and, and those of you in, in education in the room, this. KidBlog is built specifically from the ground up for, for you. So um, I've got sort of a two-part uh, presentation today. The first part is somewhat high level. It's almost a little bit more philosophical. Um, and I think that actually could be a, uh, an interesting uh, way to, to talk about this approach because it looks like most of the folks in the room have some kind of personal or professional blog that they maintain for themselves, but then the percentage of folks who actually help um, uh, create those same spaces for their students uh, was a little bit lower. So that's an interesting kind of uh, uh, drop off, if you will, in the, in the amount of people that are able to or have, have gone down the road of getting their students blogging individually. And so we'll look at what, what that means and how that actually is in some ways different from what, what it means to have your own professional or personal blog as a, as a teacher or as, a, as an adult. So. Um, Hopefully the slides are advancing for everybody. And so what I've titled this uh, sort of starting point here for the, the this philosophical, if you will, part of the conversation is um, digital social portfolios. I didn't call it intro to kid blog or anything like that because what I want us to think about is what it really means to maintain a blog uh, in, in school and that it really is frankly bigger than a blog in a lot of ways. Um, and we'll talk about more about what I mean by that, but basically this Think of this phrase, digital social portfolio, as what it means for a student to maintain a blog um, in, in, in the classroom. And for those of you that uh, want to jump ahead or see if this is you know, worth, <laughs> worth listening to, if you want to get like, your hands on the presentation, there's the, uh, the web address for it right off the bat. So uh, um, I'll be going through the slides quickly here, but um, at the end of things, that, that link will get you there as well. And then I do have a link to some other uh, resources. very education specific applications of um, using KidBlog with different uh, Web 2.0 tools out there so that you can create a really rich um, content and conversation ecosystem in your class. So uh, if you do want to get in touch with me, feel free to email me personally. It's matt at kidblog.org and I'd be happy to hear from anybody in the room or listening after, after we get the recording done. Okay, so just a little bit about my background. I, actually didn't start life in education. I got a, a degree in computer science from the University of Minnesota at Morris, a uh, small campus of the University of Minnesota. And then afterwards, I uh, decided that working in a cubicle maybe wasn't for me, for some software giant. So I got my education degree, my master's, back at the University of Minnesota. And I've taught third, fourth, and fifth grade in a city called Eden Prairie outside Minneapolis uh, for the last eight years. And during that time, uh, KidBlog, uh, 
came to be because it, it ended up meeting my needs for the things that I wanted my students to be able to do technology-wise. And it didn't exist at the time, and so I built it. And so there's me and, and some of my students. Uh, it does happen to be all boys in that picture. Of course, I did teach girls as well. It's just hard to get them to pose uh, next to each other for a photo. So um, that is a little picture of uh, Matt in the classroom. So you know I'm for real. Uh, there's another photo of me up at the top with my glorious, gleaming, shining head. Um, and this was my classroom web page. And so what I want to point out with this picture is something that's probably the most important takeaway from uh, today. And it's that when we're talking about student blogs, we're not just talking about student contributors to a class web page. Um, so this was my class web page. This is where I had announcements and calendars and photos of the week, you know, that kind of thing. Contact information, calendars, uh, you know, no, uh, field drip permission forms, those kinds of things, right? Kind of the nuts and bolts of the classroom. But what, I'm, what we're talking about today is the little part I have circled here where um, students actually have their own space. They're not all um, contributing just to this sort of collective space for, with the the daily grind, if you will, of the classroom. They have a space that is just for them, and that's this. So students' blogs actually are simply a link off of my classroom homepage. So um, that's that's an important takeaway that those of you with a personal or professional blog, or probably likely almost all of you are maintaining a class web page of some kind, the things that we're looking at today would actually be a, uh, a link from that into more of a student-centric space. So again, this is not about maintaining a teacher website or even a class blog. It's about students individually publishing meaningful academic content for an authentic audience. And I chose those words carefully, meaningful academic content. It's actually school-related stuff. It's actually purposeful. It's not just a chat room. And it's actually for an authentic audience, whether that audience is just the classmates in, in the room, uh, in the classroom, or a, a broader global audience like many of our participants um, uh, that I recognize in the ch in the room today um, have have opened up ki their kid blog uh, classes to to the world. So um, think student focused uh, in today's session. And so, what does that actually look like for a student? Here was just a screenshot of, of uh, actually one of my students who did a uh, book club assignment in her uh, blog. And this is something that in the you know in days past this would have been done in a in a paper spiral notebook and sort of handed in to me to peruse and make sure that the objectives were met and that she did some thinking and reflecting on the reading. Um, but instead, uh, I shifted all of that kind of workflow into students' blogs. And so if you're thinking about maybe what does a student blog look like compared to a teacher blog, this, this is an example of uh, one snapshot. So again, there's these three layers of what we're talking about today. This digital social portfolio is really thinking about creating a digital notebook in the context of a social network where you create this portfolio hub for all of the amazing content that, as teachers, we know students are creating each and every day. But frankly, the outside world doesn't always understand how much kids do on a daily basis uh, because so much of their work is relegated to a, a small conference folder or a couple highlights in the hallway. You know, we put up their work uh, to, to, to de demonstrate to the school. Um, the blog becomes a it sort of opens up tons of possibilities about what it actually means to create content and, and uh, uh, show, your, show your work to the, to the world or at least a, a broader audience. Okay, so the first philosophical concept here is that we're, we're talking about creating a digital notebook. So here's a sort of provocative statement. I would contend that the notebook is dead. And with that in mind, long live the notebook because managing these paper notebooks in stacks like this is not, it's not, it's, it's not cool. Uh, we have so many, uh, so many more tools at our disposal that the, if, if you're managing stacks of notebooks like this, um, even if it's just for some assignments, I'd encourage you to, to recognize that blogs in general are a way for, for, to free you, frankly, from the shackles of this kind of uh, paper workflow and to actually make the content that's locked underneath all those little uh, speckled covers make that content unlocked and alive. And so it's actually what I often say is what's the worst part about managing this stack of notebooks as a teacher is not what it, all the notebooks that are in that stack. It's the one notebook that's not. And we all know really well how this, how this goes. And so um, when you start to use this digital workflow, you actually um, 
are able to identify these missing elements much quicker, much more efficiently, um, rather than you know rifling through stacks and stacks of papers. So again, this is this is almost for, from a teacher's perspective a selfish approach to some of this because it just makes your life so much easier. Um, it makes everybody's lives easier. I'll I'll leave it to you to read through these bullet points, but basically stories of you know oh I left my notebook at home or I or I, um, I the page fell out or it, it uh, coffee got spilled on it or something like none of that none of those kind of old uh, problems with paper notebooks still exist and you get all these additional benefits um, it, not the least of which it, at least in my experience was that I didn't have to even explicitly teach keyboarding um, uh, and do the keyboard practice. Uh, program in the computer lab anymore because students wrote so much for an authentic purpose on their blogs that they just became uh, prolific typers after a few a few weeks or, or months. So there's obvious benefits. I think we were appreciating that. So paper still has a place, but the, the, the I'd like to say stop the madness when it comes to managing these stacks of paper and let's figure out a way to create a better workflow for everybody. And so blogs are are a great way to do that. And and what's wonderful and what I want us to be uh, open-minded about is that really this isn't just about English class or, or writing assignments or things like that. Blogging and, and maintaining these digital portfolios is really really relevant to any content area. Um, and, and we can talk about more if, if people have specific questions about how I might suggest you know certain disciplines do maintain portfolios. But So we're creating this digital notebook and what's amazing is it's really liberating because it's not just in a in a vacuum. It's not just in this isolated notebook anymore. We're actually part doing this in in the context of a social network, aka your classroom, uh, and perhaps even even the world. And the reality is that when students um, have a, an authentic audience, amazing things happen. So communication plus reciprocation equals motivation. What this means is a student writes something, they get a comment back, and everybody's more motivated to keep the uh, conversation going. So uh, this is really the heart of the matter for a student and why it's so valuable to get them um, involved in this uh, individual portfolio kind of approach. So this is sort of a uh, sort of a I don't know almost personal question for for us teachers. It's it's how authentic is is our students audience? And if the answer to this is that their primary audience for the work that they do is just me, the teacher, then I'm probably not doing that content justice because it, it, it deserves, frankly, it deserves more than my eyes. Um, and I, there's still a role for me to play as a teacher in, in terms of um, helping that student along in the process of content creation. But if I'm the, if I'm the payoff at the end, um, no wonder some of our students aren't motivated to write um, or, or share their work because uh, it's typically just for the teacher. Or if they're lucky, maybe it goes on a bulletin board or you know, a little kind of a, a gallery walk in the classroom. But usually that's that's a, the extent of it. And so we're, we're trying to just blow that out of the water and break down a lot of these walls um, when we talk about, in, uh, talk about these digital portfolios. So if you're interested, I, th I think if this is not linked, um, it, it should be. This is in a, uh, off the live binder. This is a really amazing conversation from some teachers uh, talking about the, act, the, the motivating forces involved in getting students to be able to contribute uh, to, to a blog or, or publish their work online. It's, it's, it's a really great uh, discussion and I really encourage you to, to check it out. And it's not even necessarily kid blog specific, like while this is a kid blog focused conversation today, those of you using other blogging platforms, you know, go for it. Kid blog has a lot of advantages that I think uh, you'll, you'll appreciate, but there's, there's ways to do this with, with any kind of um, platform out there. Kidblog just happens to be the best. Of course I'm really biased. So I think one of the one of the main problems with just writing specifically uh, is is these posters. Now I don't know about the folks in the room, but I had these posters on my wall in my classroom. Talk, talked about them, looked at them almost every day. And when I took a second look at these, I noticed something very interesting and that is that um, publishing in both of these uh, writing process workflows, whether it's this traditional writing process or the six plus one traits, publishing is an afterthought. In the case of the, the, the trait, six traits of writing, it's literally an afterthought. Like they publish the six traits and then realize, oh wait, we need to think about you know, how this actually looks and is presented to a final audience. So they said, oh, we'll call it the six plus one traits. And so that, that should be a, a wake up call to us that 
for students, what it means to publish something right now is that the publishing is sort of this glimmer of light at the end of a very long, sometimes dark tunnel of the writing process that becomes very daunting. And so it's no wonder that some of our students are reluctant writers because we put them in the context of a process that is, is very, um, it's almost high stakes and, and very low, um, high risk, low reward in some ways, putting a lot of effort, a lot of time, and at the end, we're publishing something that maybe isn't even, you know, viewed or consumed by anybody other than, other than the teacher. Um, so let's make, let's make publishing more than an afterthought, and let's sort of rethink what it means to publish things as a student. Um, and so what blogs do is they put publishing at the forefront of the conversation. So here's a screenshot from a kid blog publishing interface. And what I'm pointing out here is that publishing for a student in this context is one blue button click away for the student. Okay, so whether or not they say this is a draft and it gets reviewed by a teacher for, for later publication, that's fine. But the point is for the student, the publishing is not the sort of uh, goal at the end of the long dark tunnel in, in the afterthought of, of a, a trait that I have to care about. It's literally right in front of me and it makes such a big difference when students start thinking of the, themselves as published authors and writers and contributors to the conversation. Um, and so, again, this is just sort of a, a a uh, different way of thinking about it and, and it literally is sort of flips the writing process on its head. Um, so those of you worried about like the actual quality of the writing and if students are going to be publishing random, you know, not, not fit for human consumption kinds of stuff, those, we have, we'll have great conversations about that I hope uh, maybe during the Q&A, but uh, trust me when I say that publishing, putting publishing at the forefront will transform the way your students are uh, engaging. With, with the content creation process. And so the new writing process, in a way, looks like this. It's social publishing, where drafting and publishing are at the center of it. Um, and then there's almost a continuous revising and editing process. Um, and those of us who have taught writing know that you know, revising is one of the <laughs> hardest things to do because um, students, when they publish something, they say, oh, yeah, it's perfect. I'm done. I wrote it on my final copy, so it must be perfect. Um, and so Publish, uh, publishing digitally in this portfolio system is, is um, it's, it's very, revising is very organic. It's very low stakes, right? Instead of having to rewrite something on paper just to insert two paragraphs, um, you know, it's, it's a digital workflow. So, um, and, and the revising also can happen in the context of comments and conversations from other viewers of this content. So it becomes a much more um, almost community-based conversation about revising rather than just the teacher scribbling some, some red, you know, suggestions in the margins on the paper. Um, so um, this is sort of the new poster, the new published, the new uh, writing process, if you will. And then what the, the payoff of this is that this is a dashboard actually from my own class, which uh, was from uh, 2011. And uh, so you can see here that we had 1,187 published posts and over 4,000 comments. Uh, now, and this is all, generally speaking, academic content and conversation. And so what strikes me the, the most here is that these are conversations that, you know, teachers and students are having in their classrooms on a daily basis um, anyway. But the, you know, like, you know, you meet in a small group and you discuss something, think, pair, share, that kind of thing. Those are, those are the equivalent of the comments that, that we're looking at in this dashboard, this, this class activity statistics. What, what's striking is that without a blogging space to sort of archive those conversations, those wonderful, meaningful discussions just vanish into the ether, right? Into the educational, uh, uh, <laughs> they just vanish. And so with KidBlog, you're able to archive this, these conversations in a way that you can reflect on them later and, and grow and, and frankly as a teacher just um, in some ways, pat yourself on the back for facilitating such rich, uh, engaging discussions. So um, the statistics here can be somewhat uh, staggering in a, in a good way uh, when you think about what students are actually creating. So comments. Uh, this is the second, probably the second most important concept of today rather than this just get your students publishing in an individual space. If you get them publishing in an individual space, but there is, so there's the communication part, but there's no reciprocation, there's no conversation that follows, um, 
these, your, all the content that your students are creating will essentially wither on the vine. And people have different opinions about this. They say, no, it's just the act of publishing something that makes all the difference. I have pretty firm uh, and experiential uh, opinions on that you've got to make find a way to make sure that students have um, comments on the things that they're writing, even if it's just one comment. And, and frankly, it's preferred if it's not just from the teacher because then we have that same sort of uh, single audience member problem as we had before. So um, I see somebody in the chat just threw up a, a reference to quad blogging, an awesome way of getting your students um, putting some routine and some structure around what it means to actually comment and read different classrooms uh, content in, in, uh, in different places around the world and sort of form almost like this pen pal relationship where you sort of take turns reading and commenting on each other's content. It's a great super simple but just really powerful concept. So um, we'll, we can talk more about quad blogging um, later, later on. Okay, so just a little bit of practical advice for how to do this. If, you're, if, if your students don't have individual blogs already or if they do and you've been underwhelmed by the, shall I say, um, quality of the content that they're producing, I think the key is start with comments. In other words, don't just give your students a blogging space and say, all right, go blog. That's the equivalent of just putting a blank piece of paper in front of a student and say, okay, write a story. Like, it's very daunting. It's very, um, it's sort of a high stress situation. So, number one, you as a teacher should write some sort of post that everybody in the class can, can um, relate to uh, and preferably around some sort of academic topic. And then just have students, instead of writing their own post, they're actually just leaving comments on your, um, on your post as a teacher. So you as the teacher are s still have your own individual blog in, at KidBlog, but it's part of this whole ecosystem. Um, so that's, that's step one. Step two then is once students get comfortable commenting, um, because comments are so important, it's actually it's great that, that that is the way to start, number one. And then they're ready to go on to, you know, creating a signed, uh, maybe doing some sort of a signed writing assignment or uh, post in their, in their blog. And so, um, again, there I keep it as teacher assigned to start because I want them to understand that this is really an academic space. This is uh, one term I often use is this is your um, learning portfolio or your learning journal. So um, it, ha it, should, it should start out feeling like this is for school and not just like, oh, you know, I watched Justin Bieber on TV last night. Do you like him? You know, like it's got to be, um, uh, it's got to be, if it feels academic to start, then you can always open it up uh, later on. So then that's the opening up part is that student choice of topic with these open-ended posts where they, students will approach you and say, can I write about my vacation to so, such and such place? And you say, absolutely, we'd love to see about that, you know, learn about that as a class. And so then, frankly, you'll start getting content from students that has, uh, that's very relevant to maybe what you're learning in school, but probably didn't even originate there um, in the class. There's just so much that, that students are doing in their, in their busy lives. So. Um, and there's an example I have in a, a, a sample kid blog class that is linked here in the presentation. I can't click out to it right now, but um, we can look at what that means to respond to that teacher post. But really what it starts, it starts out as a teacher writing something and students just responding like that in line. And so it's pretty basic, pretty standard, kind of like a discussion board kind of thing. Um, but once students start writing their own content, you start getting this really intricate network of conversations going on. Um, these happen to be these image illustrator question cap, and these happen to be the, a, a great way that I use blogs to start with my, you know, elementary students, um, fifth graders, or even third graders, second graders. Um, is is the uh, we drive our all of our book clubs through through their blogs. So um, these are jobs that they have. These kind of book club roles, kind of a standard literature circle kind of thing. But again, it keeps it academic, keeps it focused, gives some structure. And then when they're ready to be more open-ended later on, they can do that. So again, these are those roles. And if you want to talk about book clubs, I could talk on and on. That's how I got started with this whole blogging thing. Um, so we can talk more about that if you like. So again, tips, emphasize comments. They are the engine of dynamic classroom blogs and these portfolios. And then don't be afraid to look at these posts and comments as a class. Gather around the, you know, the projector screen and put someone's blog up at, or, and look at some comments that are flowing and just decide if, if the kind of the content that you're seeing is um, what you want to 
be seeing. And if you start seeing stuff devolve into like text talk, like OMG and LOL and stuff like that, decide if that if this is the place for that for you as a teacher. So I, I kind of tried to make sure that we kept the text talk uh, out of the, the comments. Um, but besides stressing a little bit about just sort of the shorthand stuff, I, I, I want to you know, throw this out there that those of you that are stressed about spelling and perfect kind of um, letter perfect uh, final draft kind of stuff, um, don't stress about it because it's what the only thing that's going to happen is if you don't let students publish anything until it's um, perfectly uh, edited, it takes all the energy and frankly the joy out of the <laughs> the publishing process. Now, if you're talking about some sort of you know essay where the, the the final product is is really important and you're doing it like in Google Docs or something and it's it's you know multiple revisions and drafting and this whole ed writing process uh, that whole cycle that's fine but for gen in general don't let spelling s squash or, or or suck the life out of this blogging process um, so you know if you're one that tends to want to like moderate everything before it goes live um, I'd encourage you to maybe start that way, but eventually relax a little bit with that because um, uh, it, just, it just ends up being much more uh, motivating for students when there's a, a real-time kind of component to that. So that's just my opinion. <laughs> oh, and the reason, just the last thing, the reason I want to say don't stress over spelling uh, is because w if, if our audience, sometimes we worry about what parents or the principal or whatever else will think, the bottom line is that learning is messy. And the faster that everybody realizes that, the better. And as long as students are literally doing the best that they can, um, students already know who's struggling and who's, you know, maybe the shining star writer and who's more reluctant. They already know all those dynamics, so it's better to just make everybody feel like they're part of a broader um, community of learners and, and writers and publishers, um, rather than worry about, you know, guarding them from from eyeballs that might see something that's less than perfect. Um, again. I see Jill agreeing, le le learning is messy. Um, okay, so we got this digital notebook. We've got this social piece going on where comments are driving the, and publishing is driving the motivation. And so what we end up with is what I call the portfolio hub. You teachers, I, I haven't been able to follow the chat, you know, word for word, but I'm assuming that people have already sent out probably links to a dozen sort of web tools that are out there that they love using for different projects, whether it's VoiceThread or Vokey or, or Glogster or whatever. Teachers, we are amazing at finding and using these resources in ways that fit the unit or the lesson that we're doing. And so what I want to encourage you to think about is that your blog, your portfolio is not the replacement for those things. It is the uh, glue that ties them all together. Okay, so if you're using 12 different tools out there that you've you know, taken the time to manage some sort of account passwords and whatever for your students and they go out and they create these really cool products with these web tools, um, don't just let them sit there in some random kind of web 2.0 service you know, after, the, after your uh, lesson or unit is done. Bring those to life and keep them in the forefront of the conversation by having students embed all of that stuff in their, into their blog. So the, the third most important word from today's uh, uh, conversation is embed. If you can do anything you want to do on the web and then embed it into your blog. And when I say embed, I, yeah, I don't mean link. I mean use the embed codes that they provide so that it's actually sort of living and breathing right in front of you. You don't have to keep clicking out to go to these external resources. And then the comments can flow around um, all of that. So, um, and what ends up happening when you do that is blogs become this amazing display of evidence of learning. It's, I mean, when someone, tries to ask what a teacher does during their day and what their students are doing. It's a really hard question to answer. To answer. In the student's case, it's a typical, hey, what did you do at school today? The parent says, oh, hey, what did you do at school today? Nothing. And I think what the student is really trying to say is we did too much to even know where to start. Okay? And so what, you can, what these blogs can represent is a window into the classroom for parents in a way that no matter how effective we are at parent communication, there's still this, this barrier between the daily activity of a student and, and what families can, can really see and appreciate about that, that classroom ecosystem. So um, that's, uh, that's, this window into the classroom is a big deal. Um, and this Marco Torres is a really, really cool guy. <laughs> so, okay. 
So when we talk about evidence of learning, this is frankly the way that we're still mostly trying to sort out our evidence of learning in the classroom. Um, these bubble tests, even if you take them on a computer and you take the NWEA map test and it's supposedly adaptive or whatever, it's still a glorified bubble test. And the reality is that this test matches a world that most students are not going to live in. This cubicle world that I tried to avoid when I graduated from college with a computer science degree, um, it's still out there, but it's not the norm, right? We, 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 are, we are measuring students in a way that is in, uh, consistent with the way that they'll be measured in, in the real world. And so by creating these living, breathing portfolios, um, we create evidence of learning that's much more authentic and much more uh, aligned to the way that the, the real world works for these students as they enter this sort of distributed knowledge economy. Um, so again, this matches this, when really what we're all trying to achieve is, I think, this this more collaborative, almost cafe style conversation. And my favorite part about this is that the, the, it's almost like you don't even appreciate the teacher. The teacher's kind of off to the side like, OK, everybody, uh, looks good. Keep doing what you're doing. And so we can sort of like, get out of the way in a good way and then come alongside students to facilitate learning experiences um, when, you know, when they need it, but let students really um, be empowered. And if, whether or not every student has a laptop in front of them at all times, it doesn't matter. You can do some of these blogging things with, you know, 10 minutes in a, or 20 minutes, uh, two days a week in a computer lab. You don't need to have a one-to-one -one iPad program. And a great example of, of students using this to connect on a broader scale is this International Dot Day. Where, um, I'm assuming some folks in the room participated. This is actually uh, a, a screenshot from uh, Lisa Parisi's class out in uh, uh, Long Island, New York, um, and this is this is one of her students' dots. And uh, this person was able to share kind of their vision for just a little way to make the world um, better. And they used their blog to do this. And so it, it didn't just sit on a poster uh, in, a, in a classroom, but it actually had a wider audience. So um, this is a great example. And this is also a great example of the fact that this is, this is a very analog, hand-drawn kind of thing. All it takes is a snapshot from an iPod or iPad or a digital camera, and you can insert these things just really seamlessly into your blog. So this is, again, blogs are not a replacement for the, the traditional media that we all love and appreciate so much um, from our students. OK, so I have an example of some different tools. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to um, encourage you to do is just use this um, link in conjunction with this example kid blog class that I've set up to kind of take a peek at some of this stuff. So this is where I think I'm going to try my little screen share thing just really briefly and see. Um, maybe someone in the chat can tell me in just a second. OK. So I'm hoping that maybe maybe people can see this. Seeing it great, Matt. Just keep your okay, browser thanks, on everybody. top. There we go. OK, so this is, this is a place you can go to just kind of poke around and s just see these things in action. But basically, this kidblog.org slash social portfolios is a, is a site I set up for these uh, conversations that I've had with teachers just to show them like what this can actually look like in, in context. And so, um, you know, people that maybe, you know, you talk about using Glogster for different things. Well, again, embed, embed, embed. This is, this is a Glog uh, about Thomas Jefferson that's literally living inside a, a kid blog post that can result in um, some conversation through, through the comments. So um, use these rich media tools that are out there and then come back to your kid blog space and, and embed them and it becomes uh, a living kind of document. Another one that's, you probably won't hear the sound on this, but if anybody uses Edu Creations, they're a really great um, white, sort of a whiteboard recorder for the iPad. And so you, you won't, I don't think, hear the sound here. But this is a teacher that's solving some sort of trigonometry problem, which, you know, I won't bore you because I'm sure we're all familiar with the arc sine and cosine and things like that. But um, bottom line is that uh, these, you can you can use these different tools, and for this one, it's it's literally as simple as just um, pasting the URL to your education, and it will embed it automatically for you. You don't have to worry about any weird embed codes. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with Kidblog, one really cool feature that we have is because your 
class drives the context for the for the login, this class URL. Um, instead of have students having to remember like a really complex username, all they have to do is choose their name from the list. So this is really great for our younger students who shouldn't need to remember a unique, weird, obscure, unique username for every service that they use. Um, they all they need to remember is a is a password. And so um, I can just show you the embed code for this um, this EduCreations video. It literally is just the um, the link to this to this uh, screencast. So it's it's if you're you know if you're afraid of HTML or whatever, like it's not a lot of these things don't even don't even require that level of uh, of uh, complexity. So I'll I'll leave it to you to kind of take a take a look at some of this stuff. Um, but basically, if you're using, uh, I'm going to give a shout out here to Animoto. Um, this is this is the way I started doing book reports. No more. Um, uh, you know, writing about or reflecting on your book on a little piece of paper and handing it to me so I could kind of log things in or whatever. Their reading log became a um, section of their blog. And so students are able to create these really um, rich, exciting kind of trailers for these movies, or uh, sorry, these books. It, it makes these things come alive. And so what I found is that students, um, and I know the video probably doesn't come through awesome, but um, students were no longer sort of coming up to me in the in the in the library when we go and sort of have our weekly or biweekly checkout and say, yeah, Mr. Hart, I don't know, I don't know what to read, or I don't have any ideas for books, because th this this book, um, these uh, book talks and their blogs became um, this recommendation engine for books that p kids could see what their friends were reading and get kind of a taste of it and and. Um, and frankly, it's, it, it more closely resembles why adults read books, right? We read books because somebody recommends it to us. A friend read it and said we need to read it. And so now this, this again, starts to act more kind of like the real world, if you will, um, for students. Um, those of you that are doing Evernote uh, or Google Docs, Evernote is awesome because you can take handwritten work and actually even make it searchable. This is a, ser this is a, a search for the word welcome in the cursive writing I did and Evernote was able to find it and I could post this. So what I like to think of Evernote is like a, my um, digital junk drawer for like all these different uh, things that you can you know, scribble or, or take notes on during a school day and then use your kid blog portfolio as a way to curate some of that and filter out the chat and make sure that you actually are presenting kind of your best work forward. So um, Evernote is awesome. The last one I'll, I'll just show is um, I'm sure most of you are using Google Docs in some capacity. You've got Google Apps for your school. Um, using Google presentations instead of PowerPoints or even Keynote is a really awesome, like this was a science experiment that two students did together. So they worked on this presentation together in Google Docs um, and then embedded it into their blog. So they had kind of this collaborative thing going on with the actual, not only conducting the experiment, but, but reporting on, on the out, uh, outcome of that experiment. And, and then post it in their blog. So now this, you know, um, this science project lives on. And instead of just demonstrating it in front of the class and sort of listen, everybody listening to one report after the other, um, you could have a day in the lab where you actually just go and everybody sort of checks out the, the, the projects that they're interested in and leaves comments about it. So um, that's the, again, if you go to this, that link, kidblog.org slash social portfolios, you'll see more examples of some of that. And uh, I'm hoping that we're back in the in the Blackboard uh, world. I'm going to just uh, get like two more slides here, and then um, oh, you had trouble embedding the group. Okay, well uh, I'll help you, uh, MC Teach. Um, okay, so again, th those are some resources. I hope everybody can see the slides. Um, well, I guess I don't have any more slides except for thank you. So um, again, these this presentation is at the top URL. The list of resources, which is actually a Google Doc that I created that links to that social portfolio page, is um, is is where you can get sort of a sense of how to actually use some of these things in the classroom. So um, now someone is asking here. I'm looking at the Q and A. I'm not exactly sure how you all want to do the Q and A, but I'll just I'll just grab one that I'm looking at while I'm seeing it come through, and then maybe Lorna can manage some of the rest of the questions. Um, like right here. Um, so Lorna, do you want to just do a little intro for the, the question part and then I can take that Edmodo one first? Okay, hearing, hearing nothing, I'm going to uh, 
Go I'm ahead. Just go uh, ahead and answer that one. Someone asked Matt and answer the uh, Edmodo one, and then I'll. Okay, so uh, I'll answer the Edmodo one, and then we can go from there. So that's another real big question: is how do these things fit together? And so, actually, a lot of what I just talked about you could do in Ed Edmodo. Um, what what happens with Edmodo is two two problems. Um, so first of all, I encourage you to use Edmodo. Uh, sometimes it's more than you need, but if if you're using it and like it, this is um, I, you should continue to do so. And what I would say is that Edmodo is used for more of the um, nuts and bolts of the class. That could almost be like that classroom homepage replacement where assignments and grade grading and quizzes and polls and things like that um, uh, and calendars and things like that, physically turning in assignments. Um, but, but that really is not the heart of a student's portfolio. What the, the heart of the student's daily work is the, the things that they're actually creating, the content that they're producing. And so KidBlog is the place to put that stuff. Right. Um, Edmodo, I believe, only allows a certain number of characters. Kidblog lets you use, you know, any number of uh, characters. It's a much, it really is a blog in the truest sense of the word. And so, um, uh, use Edmodo maybe to turn in Kidblog assignments. Right. Students have an assignment that they're referring to. They just can paste the link to their Kidblog account uh, into that, and then you can do some of the, the grading and management through whatever LMS you're using. Maybe Edmodo, maybe Schoology, whatever. But let Kidblog be this rich, really purposeful space for students to create um, and share their work without trying to manage all of the like procedural noise that, that happens in the in the classroom. Use something like Edmodo for the for the messages back and forth about oh I forgot my homework assignment or whatever. Like uh, that that'd be a good use for that kind of space. Great. And someone asked if they can change the look of their individual blogs. Yes, if you if you allow profile editing in KidBlog, students can um, choose their own uh, blog theme, and so um, and then if for some reason you want to change it, teachers, you always have control over student accounts. That's one thing that while other platforms try, um, like Blogger and, and um, even our friends over at EduBlogs try to kind of give teachers more control over the student accounts. Really, those accounts are. Um, they're almost owned by the student, and so you have much less um, administrative rights to just go in and help a student or do something on their behalf or change something inappropriate. A kid blog, you get all of that just because that's what it's built for, to make sure that teachers have that final say. And do you give your students time in class to blog, or is it a homework assignment, or both? Yeah, so anything that I would assign on the blogs, I would make sure that it was able to be finished in school at least to a degree of satisfaction. So I never wanted to penalize students who, for trying to get on and, and do extra work at home. Um, but I didn't require any outside blogging. Uh, that said, a lot of students would use their extra time at home. You know, uh, Parents are probably looking for a way to have students use valuable screen time anyway. So um, working on academic tasks is probably a good, a good way to do that. Um, but yes, if, like I said, I could manage my book clubs in two days a week in the computer lab, 30 minutes apiece. Um, and then sometimes students would take more time outside of class to enhance their work. Awesome. That's important, giving them that individuality. And Gordon asked if it's possible to incorporate third party widgets like Goodreads. Yeah, so the widgets themselves, like in terms of a sidebar widget, that's the one um, trade-off that we have right now in terms of making this really easy and, and, and um, uh, sort of appropriate for classroom use out of the box, is that we, we don't have the custom uh, kind of roll your own sidebar widget piece yet, but we will be adding that functionality. Um, that said, if you have something that, that could exist in the context of like a, a teacher's post or something, um, then you can always embed things in the po a post itself. But um, right now, the sidebar is, is more, um, a, little, a little less customizable. OK. And how do kid bloggers connect with each other? Is there a place where they can learn about other students who are using kid blog, a community, per se? Yeah, so I would definitely check out um, 
you know, Google or look up like quad blogging, which basically the quad comes from finding four um, teachers around the world that are interested in connecting classrooms, and then they sort of take turns reading and writing on each other's content. So it, it helps you bridge branch out to sort of a more public audience. And with Kidblog, it actually has the feature of if, if you want it to still stay private, you don't want it totally public to the world, but you want to give access to certain other kid blog classes. You can just add their class, um, their class URL, their class web address, kid blog web address, and it will give permission to those users, uh, those students, when they log into kid blog, that they can all sort of navigate each other's spaces, even if they're uh, more private from a, a global kind of standpoint. Um, also, uh, William Chamberlain created the. Um, it was one of the people who created the uh, comments for kids hashtag, comments numeral for kids. Um, and th that's a great way on Twitter to find teachers that are um, looking for other classrooms to connect. And what we found, or what sort of what we've seen, it, it, oh, and I see someone's doing student blogging challenge. That's another one. Quad blogging, student blogging challenge is, 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 is more of a, a centralized kind of prompt and, and um, uh, conversation that, that happens, um, and then you can locate other people through that. Um, what's great, what we've noticed just in terms of the way people respond is that instead of just putting a comments for kids link um, out on Twitter, which by the way on Kidblog if a teacher logs in, they do have a little tweet bird up at the top of their navigation screen that you can just automatically tweet out whatever page you're on, so that's kind of convenient, and it will put the comments for kids hashtag in. And what we're finding is that um, it, it works better instead of just saying, hey, my kids wrote some stuff. Will you come read all of it and maybe leave some comments? Um, it works better to maybe hi like find a student or two who actually have some particular content that you really want to highlight and that you think people will um, respond to and, and basically be a little more specific with your comments for kids tweeting. And that will um, be essentially be less stressful for the, the visitor to try to find the content that they want to, to comment on if maybe it's a little bit structured out of the gate. So that's just an idea. Another person asked, is the students have access to their kid blog blogs after they leave that teacher's course or class? They do. So the teacher man is still the, you know, um, still has administrative rights to that student, but the, that, that, that kid blog student account lives beyond that year. And the, the way to actually make sure that that content lives on is as a teacher, you will want to archive your class at the end of the year instead of deleting everything. Um, that sort of, you know, deleting everything in your kid blog account is kind of the equivalent of taking all your writer's notebooks and just throwing them in the recycle bin at the end of the year, which I personally think is kind of a, <laughs> a tragedy that that happens a lot of times with, with students. And so, um, yeah, so archive your kid blog content. It'll mean they can't go in there and add anything else. No new comments will appear, so you won't have to worry about moderating anything. Um, but uh, that content will still live on, and then the student can um, join next, another class, perhaps the next year if that teacher is using kid blog, simply by entering a class registration code, um, and they'll they'll just join the class automatically. They won't, that that teacher won't need to create new accounts and things like that, and and that's a way for students to maintain. Um, portfolios year after year um, that will sort of stay with them with that same user account even though they're, they're being parts of different uh, kid blog conversations. That, that will be so helpful and beneficial to students. And John, do you have a mic that you'd like to ask your question? Yeah, um, just to make sure everyone can uh, hear me. Matt, it's an excellent presentation. Um, my question is, you talked quickly about um, how you do your lit circles, and I do lit circles every week. And I just would like to get an idea of what you do um, on a weekly basis and how you run your uh, lit circles with your class and how you kind of run it with the blog. Yeah, so that is actually an entire presentation that I do at ed tech conferences. So I won't be able to give you the full answer in, in a minute here, but I will give you a link to, frankly, all of the materials that I distribute with that, the presentation I do. Um, and this will at least just give you a starting point. Um, forgive me that this link is a little bit, a little bit long, but I'll just put this here. Um, so basically, whatever you're doing on paper can be done. Are, are you doing it on paper right now? 
Yeah, they, my kids meet every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday um, as a discussion. Yes, we, we do various things, but one of them is either a, a written um, you know, journal entry, but then the other one is like the questions you have, but yeah, it's all done on paper. Yeah, so what, what basically the, the, the short story is um, students will um, do whatever journal entries they're doing on paper. They will do those in their blogs, and, and they'll have different roles each week so that not everybody is writing the same thing every week. Um, and that, that just keeps it kind of fresh, but it still puts some structure around it. And so the, the blog becomes that journal, and then the, dis the, the discussion for the group actually takes place in the computer lab or at some laptops in the classroom or on iPads, where students' com discussions is actually in the form of comments on those journal entries. And that, that's a way of creating that archive or that record of the conversation. And then if, you know, we're not trying to take away like FaceTime and conversation, but then people can actually come together and, and maybe discuss further in person some of those comments. The, the beauty of that, that method is that those students who may not speak up in person in just an impromptu like group meeting, if you have a shy student or whatever, those same students often will be very prolific when it comes to commenting. And so um, it, it essentially lets kids with different learning styles and personalities engage in the conversation in ways that are very safe and um, uh, you know, comfortable for them. So uh, going to this sort of keeping it digital, keeping the, converse, you know, keeping the conversation in the form of the comments uh, is just a way to, frankly, expand the, the discussions that your students are having. Um, and it's, it, was, it was revolutionary for me in the classroom. Good. Book clubs were literally all I used to use my students' blogs for. Um, and then eventually it evolved into much richer portfolios. But yeah, that's book clubs, literature circles is a perfect place to start because it's something you're already doing in the classroom. And frankly, as the teacher, it'll just make your life so much easier to have all this stuff digitized and not just in notebooks. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. And I'd love to talk more, you know, over email or whatever if you want to email me. Great. Thank you so much, John. And we're going to go ahead and continue taking questions. I know it's at the top of the hour, so if you have to leave, um, we understand. Uh, but we'll go ahead and continue recording, and you can access any part that you miss at a later time. Tina, would you like to make a comment or share something? Uh, yes, hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, Peg, sure can. Sure can. Thank you. Peggy asked me just to share some of the things that I was doing. I teach um, third grade, and we've been using Kid Blogs for about three years, and we just love it. Every year, I'm usually the first teacher to introduce students to blogging, and um, you know, it becomes a place for them to share their writing. I feel that it's very important that you get an audience out there, that you join some of these groups, quad blogging. Um, the 100 Word Challenge is another wonderful one. There's yeah. writing prompts on there that the students um, can only use 100 words to write on their post, and then they link it to the 100 Word Challenge website. And there are teachers on the 100 Word Challenge that will leave your students' comments every week, and other students will leave comments. So, you know, other people are seeing your blogs, and, and the children just blossom when they're getting these comments from around the world. And their writing grows so much more because other people are reading it. It's not just me. You know, their parents are seeing it. Um, we take part in the student blogging challenge that Edublogs does. That's a 10-week course, and every week is a different prompt, a different activity for the students to do. But it's just so wonderful to see the kids grow through the year and get excited about these kid blogs, you know, along with, as Matt said, a place to embed all of our Web 2.0 projects, too, to share with others and to share with parents. So we love it, and if you haven't tried it yet, give it a try. And thanks, Matt, for all the new features. We love the avatars and tag clouds, and keep them coming. Awesome. Thanks, Tina. I recognize you from Twitter. It's nice to hear your voice. Thank you so much, Tina. We appreciate that. Um, before I take Paula's question, some people were asking how um, it's possible that Kid Blood is free and is it going to be able to stay free? Yeah, so as a former classroom teacher, I know that the only, frankly, the only tools I would use are good tools that were free, and so we'll always have a free option for teachers. We may, uh, we, we, we are rolling out um, uh, some premium features for, you know, for teachers, but also for uh, districts. Um, if, if there's sort of a tech administrator that wants to have a little bit more insight into some of the, um, you know, the interactions and, and help manage those spaces for teachers, that might, that would be a, a premium kind of feature. But any, any functionality that is there now will, will always be free for, uh, for teachers. So that's, that's that. 
Awesome. And Paula, do you have a question or a comment? Hi, <clears throat> Hi Kim. I'm sorry. I have quite okay. a cold, so I hope I'm coming through. Oh, I hope you feel... Okay. I just wanted to um, talk about using uh, blogging from a non-ELA standpoint. I do not teach reading or language arts. I am a science social studies math teacher, and I've been using Kid Blog for three years. Um, instead of having my students write reflective math journals in their notebook, I moved it online using Kid Blog. And I've been very excited with all the new changes that have come out. Um, this year we are doing um, their science animal reports you know, for science class. They will be adding, um, we're doing famous American reports this month in February, American hero reports. And so there's a lot of ways to use blogging, even if you are not an ELA teacher. Hi, Matt. Hi, Paula. Great to, great to hear your voice, even though it's a little bit stuffy. Thanks for sharing, Paula. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I just want to uh, piggyback off that. I alluded to that during the slides where, you know, like any subject area, truly any subject area can apply to this. Sometimes the PE teachers of, of the world feel like they're left out in some of these conversations, for example. Um, but think about all of the things you could do with videotaping students, you know, shooting a basketball or, you know, heaven forbid, doing a square dance or something like that and be able to post it on their blog. Um, really in, in not not in blog in terms of my writing journal, but my learning journal, my digital social portfolio. It really is um, if, for, frankly the, the the litmus test I would use in the classroom was if I was going to do a project or an activity with students and I couldn't find a way to get this um, rec recorded in their blog or documented in their learning journal somehow, I, I hesitated to do it because I wanted to make sure that whatever I was doing was able to be um, documented and shared and, and celebrated by the uh, by the students and their families. And that's definitely important. Um, Shambles asked if Kid Blog works on iOS devices. Yeah, I guess I didn't mention that. I should have. We have our, we, we uh, released an iOS app this uh, school year. So I think it was like back in October. Um, we've had a couple. Uh, updates to that throughout the year for performance and features and things like that. Um, and also, if you're on a, a non-iOS device, the WordPress app, Kidblog is the back end of Kidblog is WordPress, and so it works with the WordPress app. It's a little bit trickier to get your accounts um, imported into it, but it, it definitely works. So um, if you really want to have that native app experience, um, use the Kidblog iOS app or the WordPress app. Oh, that's awesome! Looks like it is in the live finder. And you can access those on Android as well. That's right. And and frankly, you know, a lot of the the interaction with the the website, you know, the kid blog um, content works just fine in the the, the browsers on these dev mobile devices. So you just use a web browser and go to your uh, page, and and you can consume and and even publish in that space. You don't even need the app, but sometimes people like to have that. And C. Snakey asked about, um, was saying that the person was having difficulty or their kid blogs would load slowly and they've addressed it with their tech people, but it's not on their end or their infrastructure causing the slow loading. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, first of all, uh, uh, we apologize, and that's, uh, that's, um, We've had just a huge increase in traffic over the past couple months, and so that really has been our network trying to keep up. And we've actually added servers in the last couple days that have um, that are in place to handle some of that. So this even just next week, starting Monday, you'll notice a much better um, responsiveness to the website for sure. So thanks for mentioning that, and uh, we're we're on top of it. Oh, well, that'll be exciting. Speed is always uh, definitely more helpful. Especially with uh, yeah, younger believe me, students. I appreciate as much. Yeah, I appreciate as much as any of you that uh, having 30 students in a computer lab waiting for a page to load is no fun for the teacher. So um, yeah, we're all, we're on top of it. And um, Matt asks, how do you keep track of the commenting from the students? Or yeah, so the the comments are um, all visible in the teacher's uh, dashboard. 
so the control panel, so you can uh, filter out comments by um, user or by date, um, and so you can you can access comments and moderate them through that that control panel there. So if you've used WordPress, it's it's very similar. We've added a few features to make it easier to drill down and find specific comments. But um, uh, yeah, so that's you you would you and you can set different moderation settings. So you may want to make sure that you approve every comment before it goes live. Um, so that's that's an option that you have uh, as well. And Sue Waters recommends from EduBlogs that if you're overseeing several different blogs versus just like your class of blogs, you can always subscribe to the RSS feed of any comments on their blogs and then be able to monitor and, and uh, watch them that way as well. Just yeah, yeah, if you're using another platform, that's sort of a requirement. Um, KidBlog is designed to sort of get around that by making sure that all of your students' uh, content and conversations just flow right in the in your dashboard, all in one place. So you don't have to do things like manage RSS feeds and things. Um, so yeah, that's a if you've got some other blogging um, pl solution out there, then that's that would be the way to do it. And that's a great idea, Paul, about the blog commenting party to teach parents and show parents. And and I'm not sure if the person's question was answered about um, they wanted to know if they could post a kid blog and have those blogs post to different like Google or Blogger to other blogging platforms um, or export it. Yeah, with that, with with that, you know, if you want to sort of make the content appear elsewhere, you could. That is where you could use an RSS feed. Um, but in terms of like cross posting it to other platforms, it doesn't do it now. But it doesn't do that. But you, by the end of the school year, will have an export feature that if if you do want to sort of package up the content and 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 take it with you somewhere, that you can do that. Okay. And Susie asks if there are any tips for how you track students' completion of the work via their blogs and what type of record keeping or yeah. So if you assign grades. Yeah. So that. That, yeah, that's a good question. So KidBlog, it, the, the short answer is we, we're trying not to be yet another online gradebook. Um, there's plenty of those out there. And uh, so we, we wanted to make sure that any functionality that we present in the system is really focused on kids creating great content, not necessarily teachers um, uh, assigning grades to that content. Now, that said, that's still an important part of the uh, you know, education process. and so. The reality is every teacher's workflow is a little bit different for that. You have you you know you have um, an LMS platform that your school uses or an SIS system where you're entering grades anyway and you're managing sort of this workflow. So um, you know a lot of times teachers will just have it could be as simple as you know they've got their browser open and in one tab they have their they're going through kid blog posts and in the other tab they have their their learning management system that they're sort of entering grades here and there and and. It's sort of just you kind of just flip back and forth, rather than try to be again, like I said, a, a yet another online gradebook or assignment uh, submission platform. There's frankly there's there's plenty of those. So if you're using something like Edmodo or whatever or Schoology, you can you can reference the KidBlog. You can turn assignments in from KidBlog into that system, uh, for example, and then assign grades that way. But we want to keep it focused on the content, um, not necessarily the uh, evaluation. I agree. I think keeping those separate are a great idea. Um, if there are any questions that I might have missed, please type those in the chat or click on the hand and we'll give you the mic and you can ask Matt your question directly. I think those are the questions that I took down. But again, if I overlook something and you'd still like to ask that, um, feel free to let us know so we can have Matt address your question. I was just. It looks like Gordon has some interesting comments about being able to comment back to um, some, you know, the people that are leaving you the comments. Um, so WordPress by default has a URL field. If you're leaving a comment, you can put in a URL. Um, I guess, frankly, my thought on that is that generally, when someone is leaving a comment uh, for a student, that um, or when a student is leaving comment for another student, that URL field is just a little bit uh, more. Uh, 
you know, typing than they need to really do. So if, if there is a URL that, that you want to paste, you could do it in the comic itself. But Kidblog will be rolling out functionality where if, if you are in the Kidblog system, you know, you have an, uh, an account that way um, that we will be able to sort of link to the, that commenter's name and then sort of jump back and forth that way, but, pr but not driven through sort of manually entering a URL. So just wanted to address that. That's a good idea. And will you be presenting at ICE this year? Um, uh, not, not as of now. I guess uh, yes. I'm not, I'm not slated to speak at ICE this year. But um, if there's teachers out there that are using Kidblog, you're <laughs> we always love it when our users, uh, you know, share the love. Absolutely. Are there any other questions before we kind of wrap things up? Will Matt be at Q? Uh, I will not, but again, I'll, I'm, I'm always on Twitter sort of following those things, so any shout outs or any connections you want to make, um, you know, we can do that. And did you request parents permission for your students to make a blog and have an online presence? Yes, I did, and I just had it actually part of my um, standard stack of forms at the beginning of the year that just said, you know, if, if in our class we students have the opportunity to um, maintain content online, um, and so do you give permission for you know for students to do that and for that content to be displayed, you know, to a, a more public audience? And uh, I think in eight years I only had one parent that said no, thank you, and um, you know, that, that's another thing. I, I would always, you know, find ways to, um, uh, if student did not want to participate in that capacity, you know, I, th there'd be alternatives if they wanted to do the paper thing. But um, generally speaking, everybody appreciates the, the digital workflow. I agree. It just eases the load. And happy Chinese New Year to you as well, Shambles. Um, there are comments <laughs> being made about, um, hoping to see you and Dan at ISTE this summer. I also uh, express my same sentiment and to everybody since it's going to be in my hometown this summer. Um, ha, you're done in San Antonio. Yes, huh? yes. I'm looking forward to not having to travel other than just driving into the to the uh, session. So that would be great. We hope yeah, we're, hope, we're, hope, we're, hoping, we're hoping to be there, yeah, for sure. And we'll, we'll bring some swag with us. Awesome, because they were talking about, no, I'm not hosting a party, but I, I should host some type of tweet up or clerk up um, or yeah, yeah. something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, well, if you have questions, please contact Matt um, after the session on, on Twitter if something comes up. But we want to let you know that Steve Hargadon is going to be hosting some interview sessions next week. He'll be interviewing Howard Reingold on the 12th. And he will be interviewing Michael Fullen on the 13th and Paul Thomas on the 19th. Those are all at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. And we want to let you know that next week on the 16th, we will be talking about Evernote for student collaboration with Nicholas Provenzo, who's supposed to be the Evernote guru, or one of them, for using Evernote with students. And then Ryan Hung, who's going to be a fabulous featured teacher session. And Stretch and Scratch, um, a very innovative um, technology thing that she has in her classroom. Heidi Williams, and another, our March featured teacher session is Jamie Cook. She's an eighth grade math technology teacher. So that's going to be great. So make sure you stick around for those sessions. And we would love for you to nominate a featured teacher or an educator for a future session. Anybody that works with students or teachers using that link, and that link is in the live binder. So please share that, um, that link and fill that out and give us some suggestions for future special guests. And if you would also give us some feedback on today's session in the survey, the survey link will automatically open in your browser once you exit the session. And anytime you view a recording, you can also um, fill out the survey using that link that's right there. And it's also in our live binder.
in addition to feedback from today's session or any future session, we you can request a professional development certificate. Just put your name and information in the session that you attended. And Peggy will send those to you via email. So give us a bit of time to get that situated. And she always takes care of that. And uh, you can turn in your certificate or post them on the wall, whichever you prefer to do. We do have an iTunes U channel that we post our MP3 and MP4s to each week. It's free. You can subscribe to the channel to get all of them downloaded or individual uh, sessions. Or you can use an RSS feed aggregator and subscribe to the blog post where we post the recording links and all the resource links as well. So you have both of those options available to you. And we want to extend a very special thanks to Matt uh, for providing such a great presentation today and to Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of our webinar series, and to Weasley for providing our website, and to each of you for your fantastic conversation and links and ideas that you share every week. We're so, so grateful for that and to Blackboard for allowing us to have this platform for us to meet every week at the same time. So thank you so much, and thank you again, Matt, for joining us today. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about Evernote for using Evernote with students in your classroom. So have a great weekend or a great Saturday, everybody. Take care and hope to see you online soon. Bye-bye.